Joining me now is Sam Lee. He is the president and CEO of North Isle Copper and Gold. Great to see you in person. Thanks, Mark. Very nice to see you as well. So we want to uh, get a little um, update, refresher for those who may not know uh, about the company. You say you're, you're, you're sitting on uh, some of the more attractive and, and promising uh, resources in Canada. Uh, explain that. Sure thing. So, um, look, I mean, I think the genesis of the thesis here uh, is that uh, the world needs more copper, right? $1.2 trillion needs to be spent uh, to get to our 1.5% aspirational climate goals. Uh, of that $1.2 trillion, $750 billion needs to be earmarked for copper projects uh, across the world. Um, and I can tell you right now in the database, there does not exist that many copper projects in the world. Coupled with the, uh, the need to be focused on low ESG jurisdictions in the world, of which really the only two identified by Wood Mackenzie are Canada and uh, Australia from a mining perspective, um, there really is this incredible confluence of uh, focusing on these types of assets that North Isle Copper and Gold has, which is a copper and gold porphyry, if you can imagine, uh, in British Columbia. Now, you were a banker at CIBC for a long time, yep. so uh, tell us a bit about that and also tell us about this, uh, this uh, recent private placement that you struck. Sure thing. Um, so I'm a metallurgist first and foremost by training, uh, but I did spend the last 20 years uh, with CIBC. I ran their global mining practice out of Vancouver, so all of my clients were the larger incumbents, uh, mostly with an M&A and equity focus. Um, so I, I did find that probably the most dominant period during those 20 years was in the sort of second half of the super cycle, call it 2006 to 2011, when we saw you know hundreds of billions of dollars of transaction occur during that period of time. And that was predominantly for copper and gold projects like this, material, large copper gold projects, a little bit of a different um, thesis back then. It was bigger is better uh, back then and with a reasonably uh, I wouldn't say low regard for ESG, but it was effectively a box that needed to be ticked. Uh, what I'm seeing today, uh, certainly as it relates to you know, some of uh, what the incumbents are projecting uh, recently, is that ESG is no longer a box that needs to be ticked, it's actually a criteria. Uh, and so I, I do think, again, the con confluence of getting social license uh, for material large projects uh, for both copper and gold has become a, uh, a focus for the incumbents and we're seeing that through a lot of the M&A deals for gold companies going after copper projects. And the, the, the private placement, you brought in some fairly big names? Sure thing. So we just announced a couple of days ago <coughs> that we raised two million dollars through Cornerstone Group. So this is an at-market deal, no warrants, no half warrants, a uh, group that consists of uh, Donald K. Johnson, uh, who uh, many of you know is uh, vice chairman of uh, BMO, but uh, probably better known for uh, a lot of the uh, impressive uh, investments that he's made that has uh, created his wealth. Um, and uh, our chairman, Dale Corman, who maintains his 11%. For those of you who don't know, Dale uh, has recently been inducted into the Mining Hall of Fame. He was responsible for a number of things in his career, but probably most notably uh, developing Penasquito, um, taking it from a $2 million project to a $1.2 billion project in six years and selling it to Glamis Gold Corp. Uh, and then thirdly, Michael Gentile, who remains a very strong, influential shareholder at 9.9%. Uh, I will also be participating in this offering as well. So with those four, uh, we uh, are closing it tomorrow and um, we are fully financed for our 2023 drilling program, as well as our corporate um, GNA. Okay, so let's get to that. I know you want, you're looking to expand the, the Hushamu project. Uh, you've got drilling plans for Northwest Expo. So what's the, what, what is the, what are the plans? Uh, sure, sure, sure. sure. So our first priority is to get a 40 to 50 million tons of incremental um, resource from Northwest Expos, which is only about a three kilometer distance from our main project, our $1.1 billion NPV project, 5 billion pounds of copper equivalent. Uh, this is our flagship project. Um, and uh, for, for some reason, the market is not giving us value. We're currently trading at a 4% of our total net asset value, uh, which is paltry, and that's based on $3.25 copper prices and 1650 gold prices. So that's our cornerstone underpinning value proposition for the market, which uh, at $40 million obviously is not being uh, conditioned. Um, but this, the second part, the Northwest Expo, is an incremental uh, 40 to 50 million tons of approximately four, three to four times higher grade and two to three times higher metal value. And we're looking to get that announced um, uh, sometime in the second half of this year. 
Okay, so uh, back to the stock. You think you compare very favorably with peers in terms of grade, life of mine, CapEx, uh, market cap as well. You think there's immense potential for re-rating on the stock. What, what is the market not getting right now? Sure. I, I'd like to say that on an individual basis, no project has it all, right? And so, what are the things that the market is discounting us for, okay? Well, we are a lower grade porphyry, which porphyries generally are lower grade, and we are lower grade porphyries. Um, but my, uh, uh, I guess, uh, response to that is that we've got an extremely low strip ratio, right? So lower grade, lower strip ratio creates economic ore, which is obviously what we have in our uh, preliminary economic assessment that shows a 20% after-tax IRR at $3.25 copper prices. Um, you know, I think that the biggest component of our story is how good the infrastructure is and support within local communities and First Nations and government is. Uh, it's funny, I just actually ran into a good friend of mine, Ross Beatty, here today at this conference who just gave a talk. Oh, you're dropping names now. I am dropping, <laughs> but I have to drop this one because he knows this project extremely okay. well. And, uh, and he mentioned to me that he's been advocating for this perception or against the perception that you just can't permit a mine in British Columbia or in the location that we are on the island, which is the north part of the island. Um, the reality is that, that is, uh, it is an irrational belief. There's no difference in permitting a mine in the island than it is in BC. BC currently has three of the largest copper mines in Canada producing and have permitted over seven mines in the last 10 to 15 years. So um, British Columbia uh, aspirationally wants to be the epicenter for critical metal development across the world. We have been publicly identified by the Minister of Mines, Energy and Innovation as leading that approach around First Nations and development, making sure that we find that point of intersection such that we can become not only the leaders in mining but also in developing mines responsibly and successfully with a uh, strong support from our First Nation partners. Well, thank you, Sam, for uh, telling us about the uh, uh, what's happening at North Isle. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks All very right. much. Good stuff. CEO of North Isle Copper and Gold, Sam Lee.